True Freedom by Jason Goldtramp I was blessed to grow up in a loving home. My father, George Goldtramp, was a preacher for many years in the Churches of Christ. My mother, Peggy Goldtrap, was a writer and a faithful companion to him. She heard his sermons long before anyone else. She was always there by his side, offering encouragement and creative criticism. My father and my mother encouraged me, my sister Lynn, and my brothers George and Jeffrey to always keep an open mind and loving heart in regard to all men. He taught us to use good judgment, practice charity, be grateful, and never, never take yourself too seriously. Every Independence Day was an occasion not just for saying all firecrackers and tossing horseshoes and eating homemade ice cream. It was a day to reflect on the meaning of the words found in the Declaration of Independence. A typical family function would include prayers for the nation, a reading of the preamble, first paragraph and conclusion of the Declaration of Independence, and a discussion about the history of the signers. My favorite such celebrations were in the small town of Adams, Tennessee, just north of Nashville, on the farm of my uncle Ewing Harper. About 60 family members and close friends would gather together at the creek. Food would be set on picnic tables, and a large flag would be hung on a tree where it could catch the breeze. We would eat fried chicken, roast beef, catfish, collard greens, mashed potatoes, rolls, cornbread, chocolate cake, Toll House cookies, iced tea, and there was always a hammock nearby for when lunch was over. The kids would splash in the creek and their parents would visit and get caught up on all the family news and recall precious memories. My father, who in the early 1970s had served two terms as a county commissioner of Lee County, Florida, was well versed in the issues of the day. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, God says, And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. America is a nation built on prayer. September 16, 1620, Southampton, England. Before the Puritans boarded the Mayflower, they prayed. When they arrived November 19th off Cape Cod, they prayed. George Whitfield was a noted English preacher who taught a controversial idea. Faith in God must be a bottom-up approach between the individual and his creator. Man was free from the dictates of the hierarchy of priests and bishops established in the denominational world. God loved you. It was your duty to love him back and spread his love through your good deeds. The simple message resulted in him being banned from most churches of the day, so he preached in the open air, with sometimes 30,000 people in attendance. He influenced the American colonies to be pious and charitable, and he influenced the founding fathers to think about the meaning of the word freedom. Jacob Duche was the first chaplain of the Continental Congress. On September 7, 1774, he read from Psalm 35, a psalm of vengeance, and then led a prayer. In that prayer, he said, Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsel of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation, that the scene of blood may be speedily closed, that order, harmony, and peace may be effectually restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish amongst the people. Preserve the health of their bodies and the vigor of their minds. Shower down on them and the millions here they represent such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world, and crown them with everlasting glory in the world to come. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. George Washington prayed at Valley Forge. On September 17, 1782, Congress approved the purchase and distribution of the Aiken Bible, the first Bible published in America. It was confidently endorsed as the pious and laudable undertaking of Mr. Aiken, and is subservient to the interests of religion as well as an instance of the progress of the arts in the country. Shortly after George Washington placed his hand on a Bible and took the oath of office to become our first president on April 30, 1789, at Federal Hall in Lower Manhattan, he and several congressmen left the ceremonies and went to St. Paul's Church to pray. On December 4, 1800, Congress approved the U.S. Capitol building for church services. Every Sunday for decades, presidents, congressmen, and ordinary citizens met to worship, pray, and hear a preacher. During the Civil War, Americans prayed. Newly arrived immigrants prayed when they saw the Statue of Liberty. In World War II, we prayed. In Vietnam, we prayed. Before we went to the moon, we prayed. At Ground Zero, we prayed. In Iraq, we prayed. 
in Afghanistan, we still pray. June 1st, 2013, Liberty High School in Liberty, South Carolina. Roy Costner IV, valedictorian. Roy's senior year had been tough because of the constant attacks by the ACLU. Prayer had been removed from school board meetings, prayer had been banned from athletic events, and teachers had been ordered to not attend the annual See You at the Pole event, a voluntary student-led prayer around a flagpole. And so Roy stood up and began reading his speech for a valedictorian, which had been pre-approved by Principal Lori Gwynn. He began his speech, but then paused and went off script. I'm so glad that both my parents led me to the Lord at a young age, and I think most of you will understand when I say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Those assembled gave him a standing ovation. Prayer in America still lives. We the people lived in a nation founded on a simple idea that men were created free and equal. We are the benefactors of the self-evident notion, and the author of this pure, natural compulsion is none other than the God of the Bible. As heirs to this abundance, it is our sacred duty to nurse, to articulate, to meditate on, and to defend the proposition set forth in the Declaration of Independence, beginning with the foundational concept of our society, that, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, we must recognize God as our Creator, Supreme Judge of the world, and we must rely on God for divine providence. God is our Creator. John Adams, in a letter to his cousin Zebdil Adams on June 21, 1776, wrote, Statesmen, my dear sir, may plan and speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue, and if this cannot be inspired into our people in a greater measure than they have it now, then they may change their rulers and their forms of government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. They will only exchange tyrants and tyrannies. The National Monument to the Forefathers in Plymouth, Massachusetts has been described as a roadmap to freedom. Dedicated in 1889, it is 81 feet tall. It's made of solid granite and weighs 180 tons. Unknown to most Americans, it came to national attention via the 2012 documentary, Monumental in Search of America's National Treasure. In the film, Patriot Kirk Cameron is led on a tour of the monument by historian Dr. Marshall Foster. At the top of the statue is Faith. Faith is pointing to heaven to indicate that God is the source of faith. She carries a Geneva Bible. Published in 1560, this was the Bible used by the Mayflower Pilgrims. As a symbol of her devotion to God and study of scripture, she proudly wears upon her head a star of wisdom. At the base of the monument are four buttresses prominently displaying important aspects of liberty, beginning with morality. Morality is holding the Ten Commandments in her left hand, while her right hand holds a scroll of revelation. Her eyes like pupils because she is inward focused, to make sure her morality comes from a pure heart. Beneath morality is an evangelist, one who writes down the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to teach morality. And on the other side is a prophet. Law holds a code book, a book that is easy to read and open to all. His right hand shows his mercy. Beneath him are justice and mercy. Faith in God produces morality, giving you a standard by which you can judge right and wrong, bringing about a sound system of law created by a free, just, and civil society that relies on quality education. Education is a young mother holding an open book. She wears a wreath of victory. The young mother knows that it is her responsibility to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, as it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. An elderly man teaches wisdom. He teaches from an open Bible and the Ten Commandments. A Christian worldview is depicted as a globe on his right. Teaching a biblical worldview that God made you free creates in man a thirst for liberty. Here sits a rugged hero. He's looking out, ever vigilant to potential foes. He holds a sword and he's ready to use it. In his left hand are broken chains. He will be a slave to no man. On his right shoulder is a lion's paw, because he has defeated the British Empire. 
The brave warrior praises God for the victory over the tyrant. Peace through strength reigns in this happy, fruitful land. So the key to this formula is faith and morality and law and education equal liberty. God created you to be free. Genesis 127 says, So God created man in his own image. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. James 1, 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. John 8, 36. Therefore the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 1 Timothy 2, chapter 1 and 2. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. Proverbs 29.18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. God created you to be free. John 4.16 I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me.